Now, I believe that Jesus is coming soon. And there's a lot of reasons I believe that, and COVID is not one of them. There's a lot of things, and I don't believe the election is necessarily a reflection of it. I do believe that you could put those things in there. But I'd believe that if neither one of those things happened the way they did. I'd still believe it. I believe that uh, indicators and signs indicate that we're close to the coming of the Lord. I really believe that. You say, well, what if you're wrong? Well, what if I am? Nobody's worse for wear. Doesn't hurt anybody. The Bible says, even so come Lord Jesus. So we need to be looking for him. You know, so uh, that's what Maranatha is all about. Come Lord, we want the Lord to come. So it's not wrong to anticipate his coming. Matter of fact, I think he's pleased when we do. And we know the rapture of the church and some don't even believe that which I think they tell us some 30 some percent. Now preachers don't even believe there's a rapture. Of course, maybe the th same 33% don't believe that you need to be born again. So I don't know, but uh, I'm just saying there's a lot of things that we used to just embrace and believe. And now they're questioned and uh, a lot of sound doctrine has just been thrown away for lots of reasons. But we still have to believe the Bible, you know. Now, if you're a rapture believer, uh, there is no sign, not a one, that has to happen before the rapture can take place. There's this thing we call the imminency of the rapture when you don't expect it. It happens. And you have to have no warning whatsoever. So the signs that we see that lead us to believe that we're approaching the end of the age are not necessarily signs that indicate the rapture uh, itself. However, if you see signs that indicate the end of the age, then the rapture has to be all the more closer because it happens before we get there. So in a sense, they are signs that lead us to know the rapture of the church is coming. But it is imminent. It could happen today. Amen? Amen. I said it could happen today. Amen. Now, uh, I believe that a great awakening must come before those events happen. And you say, well, how, why do you believe that? Well, we've had awakenings in the past and there's been historically, uh, America's had two great awakenings and we believe that many believe that there's a third great awakening coming. Now I want to cover some things and, and we'll go to the book of Daniel and I've referred to this before, but we'll go there again in Daniel chapter 12 in verse number four. But thou, O Daniel, shut up the words and seal the book even to the time of the end and many shall run to and fro in knowledge shall be increased. Everybody say knowledge shall be increased. And now I've heard that talked about for years, my whole life. I've heard references back to this passage of scripture. And I mean, often it was referred to in, you know, our great scientific breakthroughs, our great medical breakthroughs, our great universities, and, you know, even the internet and things of that nature, this just expansion of knowledge. Now I'm not saying that that's got nothing to do with it, but it's really uh, not directly what this is in reference to. We see that same passage from the Amplified Bible. I won't read the whole passage, but it says, in knowledge of the purpose of God as revealed by his prophets will greatly increase. And so the knowledge that's being talked about here in Daniel is not just the general scientific or breakthrough or medical knowledge or all those things. Now, again, that's good, but that's not what this is referring to. It's referring to the knowledge of prophetic scripture. Now, when you think about an awakening or you think about an enlightenment, that verse right there gives you prophetic understanding that that has to happen. And it says it won't happen until the time of the end. So this is not just something that could have happened any time. It happens at the end or coming toward the end of an age. And we're talking about the church age when we say the end of an age. And so it says that there will be an awakening. That's what that would refer to. How could you have knowledge 
increasing without being awakened to new knowledge or new truth. You have to wake up to it. Something you didn't know, you do know. Something that was hidden from you, now suddenly you know it. And so that verse prophesies, and we'll expand that further, but it says that there must be a time where knowledge is increased or an awakening comes. Now, the word awakening is really more a term we use for the world. Now, I'm not saying the church would be excluded from it, but if we talked about a move of God in the church world, we would probably more refer to it as a revival. Something that's already living, but it gets a new life, a, a revived life, revival. But an awakening is when those who are in the dark suddenly wake up. Now, it could happen at a variety of levels. It could come from a person who's in the total, uh, total world of darkness. It could come from a person who's partially in the dark. Uh, because there are certain things that I know over time that I've been awakened to. I begin to see things that I didn't see before. I begin to be aware of things I was not aware of before. And it's called growing. It's called just uh, becoming what we're called to be in God. And so we grow in our knowledge. Amen. And so that's what uh, Daniel was talking about there. Now we find over here in the book of Joel, and this is a fairly uh, common scripture to many of us that have been around, uh, say, Pentecost for a while. But you find in Joel chapter 2, and I want to draw some reference here, and I want to point out a few things as we read down through here. But in Joel chapter 2, verse number 22, Be not afraid, ye beasts of the field, for the pastures of the wilderness do spring, and the tree beareth her fruit, and the fig tree and the vine do yield their strength. Now the word strength there actually means, um, it actually could be translated wealth or to prosper. It, it doesn't just mean growing strong like muscles or something of that nature, but it actually means a strength that's yielded from uh, being successful and productive. It's, it's, a, it's a wealth scripture, that's what it is. But if you notice, it makes reference to two things that run in parallel in relationship to that. It says that the vine and the fig tree have a parallel unfolding of this event, this wealth that's prophesied here. And the fig tree we know is Israel, and we know because the scripture tells us that uh, blindness had come in part to the fig tree, that the Gentiles could be grafted into the fig tree. In other words, we become a part of the tree, but they're the fig tree. But we also know in uh, the book of John, it tells us that Jesus is the vine. He said, you're the vine, and I'm the branch. Or uh, he said, I'm the vine, you're the branch. That's a better way to put it. But anyway, we draw our strength from the vine. And so here we have two types mentioned right here, parallel in this scripture that yield their strength together. One is Israel as a nation, which could not have come before 1948 when they were restored as a nation. And two is the vine, which is the church. And it says, so there's a parallel thing that happens between Israel and the church. They yield their strength together. So there's a prosperity in a sense. And when I say prosperity, I'm not talking about everybody getting rich. I'm talking about just the flourishing of these entities. The church in a flourishing mode. Israel in a flourishing mode. You understand that? You get that? All right. It says, be glad, ye children of Zion. And again, Zion is a type of the church. Be glad, ye children of Zion, and rejoice in the Lord your God, for he hath given you the former rain. Everybody say former rain. Former rain. He hath given you the former rain moderately, and he will cause to come down for you the rain, the former rain, and the latter rain in the first month. So we have the former and the latter rain. Now, rain is given for harvest. And there's some cycles of harvest, and I won't go into the details of how it works, and I'm not sure totally I understand how it works, but in certain that part of the world where this was written, that the latter rain was the rain that, that prepared everything for final harvest. So there was a former rain, the growing process, and a final rain for harvest. 
former rain, latter rain. Amen. But the rain is given in typology for the purpose of preparing things for harvest. Everybody say harvest. harvest. Now, when we talk about harvest, we're not talking about bringing the, the, you know, the, the hay into the barn or the sheaves into the barn, but we're talking about the harvest of souls. That's what we're talking about here. The, the, the harvesting of this earth that Jesus died to redeem. All right? All right? And the floor shall be full of wheat, and the vats shall overflow with wine and oil. Now, there's much typology there. Wheat, again, is harvest, wine, and oil. Could be representative of the Holy Spirit. He's typified in both of those. And I will restore to you the years. Now, this is an important passage because we're going to refer back to this concept a little bit later. So just hang on to what's said here. And he will restore to you the years that the locust hath eaten, the canker worm, the caterpillar, the pommel worm, my great army which I sent among you. In other words, things that have been uh, destructive and things that have brought great harm and things that look like they've been destroyed because they've been pillaged by these insects. He said, I will restore that. So there's a restoration here that's prophesied. And the things that have been uh, maybe harmed and hurt and their purposes have been thwarted, he's going to return that. He's going to restore that. And he said, and ye shall eat in plenty and be satisfied. Now, who are we talking about here? Remember, again, he's talking to the church and to Israel. Are you a part of the church? Okay, this is you. And you shall eat in plenty and be satisfied and praise the name of the Lord your God. And he hath dealt wondrously with you and my people shall never be ashamed. Now, when we're talking about ashamed, we're talking about the shame that comes from the intimidation that these morons that want to put us in chains and fetters and want to lock us down and lock us out. Not so, McGee. Ain't going to happen. The church will never be put to shame, never be put to that kind of shame. That's what he said. And this is a last day prophetic scripture. I'm talking to you about an awakening. I'm talking to you about a revival. I'm talking to you about an outpouring. And it's all in there. And you shall know that I'm in the midst of Israel and I'm the Lord your God and none else and my people shall never be ashamed and it shall come to pass afterward that I'll pour out my spirit upon all flesh. Everybody say all flesh. All flesh. Okay, so there's an outpouring of God's spirit that he prophesied right here in the word of God. I didn't come up with that. I didn't dream that up. I'm not some church prophet trying to make everybody feel good. I'm reading to you from the Bible. And if it's in the Bible, it's going to happen. Now, I'm not putting down prophets, and I'm not putting down anything that, that, that helps us and encourages us. I'm not talking about that from that vantage point. But what I am saying, those things are suspicious. You get a prophecy, you don't know whether to believe this, but this is a passage in the Bible. You know to believe this. Amen? Amen. You know to believe that. Amen. You got that. So Daniel told us that there's a time when knowledge or an awakening shall come. And then Joel here says, listen, I will pour out my spirit upon all flesh and your sons and your daughters shall prophesy and your old men shall dream dreams and your young men shall see visions and upon the servants and upon the handmaidens in those days I will pour out my spirit. And I will show wonders in the heaven and in the earth, blood and fire and pillars of smoke. And there's so much that could be said about that. But what I'm talking about today primarily is there's a great awakening that's prophesied in the word of God. There's a great awakening that must come. So if we think that we're going to have to go underground, I'm going to tell you who's going underground and it's not going to be the church. The opponents of the church are the ones that are going to end up going underground. They don't have the verses. I do. We do. And we're not going to give in, quit, give up, turn faint, turn coward, walk back, walk out. We're not giving up. You hear me? We're not giving up. 
We don't have any give up in us. Amen. <laughs> Praise God. I could get excited here. Amen. And I will show wonders in the heavens and in the earth, blood and fire and pillars of smoke. And the sun shall be turned into darkness and the moon into blood before the great and terrible day of the Lord comes. So this happens before the day of the Lord. And that's talking about his coming. So is that in our generation? I think so. Somebody say, well, you don't know for sure that that's really our generation. Well, I can tell you what, it's closer for us than it was last generation. I can tell you that. Amen. So we know it's an end time, last day prophetic scripture. And it will happen. And he will pour out his spirit on not a few, all flesh. Well, that requires an awakening. It didn't just say the flesh in the church. It said the goldfish. I don't know if it, <laughs> well, they're flesh, you know. <laughs> but, well, you know, I, I'm not saying that exactly, but I'm telling you, I believe the goldfish will know it. I believe when a move of God happens, the goldfish, the parakeets, and everybody else is going to know it. I believe God's going to visit this planet by his spirit and by his power. And anybody who wants to know, needs to know, will know. You hear what I'm telling you? And we're not going underground. Well, you see this same thing. Now, this passage of scripture in the book of Joel, chapter 2, is, is restated and preached at the whole event there in Pentecost, when in Acts 2, they were in that upper room. They came out of that upper room. They, they, they got filled with the Holy Spirit, the whole thing there as it unfolds. And they spoke in tongues and cloven tongues like as a fire set upon them. And notice how, how it happened. It said, and suddenly there came a sound from heaven as of a rushing mighty wind. Now, now think about this a minute. Um, we have a lot of noise in our world. You go out here and stand by the interstate and you hear these semis come down and you hear noise, you know, those trucks roar by. You hear these big pieces of equipment roar by and, and do all sorts of things when you go out to maybe a, a, a construction site or things of that nature. Well, you gotta remember something in the day when that happened, none of that existed. You go here and hear one of these big jets take off. You stand at the end of the runway and listen to a big jet roar down the runway and the noise generated. They'd never heard that. They'd never heard noise at the level that we're accustomed to. And it said, suddenly there came a sound from heaven as of a rushing mighty wind. So there was a noise that, that somehow signaled the presence of God. There was a, a, a roar of wind. Have you ever heard a tornado? If you had never heard one in real life, you've heard on TV, you know, you heard. Or a hurricane. I've been in two or three hurricanes, not, not real bad ones, but, you know, it's awful when you go on vacation and they have a hurricane. I had that happen. We had it happen two years in a row. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, they weren't real bad ones, but uh, you know, any hurricane is pretty severe. You know, they got to have 85 mile an hour winds to be a hurricane. So, it, you know, it's loud. You can hear all that, you know? And so uh, anyway, the, that's what he's talking about. He said there was a sound of the roar of a rushing mighty wind and it filled the house where they were sitting and there set upon them cloven tongues like as a fire. And, and, and suddenly, they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and went out into the street. And Peter, uh, foot in mouth Peter, <laughs> impetuous Peter, Lord, let's, uh, let's build an altar up on you know, the Mount of Transfiguration. You know, just, he just blurted stuff out. You know? and, and Jesus said, uh, you know, you're, you're Peter, and on this rock I'll build my church. He, he called Peter a rock. Impetuous, foot in mouth, Peter. He called a rock. Now that's what the Holy Spirit can do for you. That's what the power of God can do in a person's life. 
and Peter in, in Acts 2.14, but Peter standing up with the eleven lifted up his voice and said unto them, You men of Judea and all you that dwell at Jerusalem, be this known unto you and hearken to my words. For these are not drunken as you suppose, seeing it is but the third hour of the day. See, now they, they heard them speaking with, with other tongues and speaking to the men in their own languages. There were all kinds of foreigners in, in Jerusalem when this happened, and they were speaking the language of the foreigners. It was a miracle. And there was the wind, you know, and all this stuff. And so uh, he said, but this is that which was spoken by the prophet Joel. What Joel said in chapter 2 that we just read. This is that which was spoken by the prophet Joel, and it shall come to pass in the last days. Everybody say last days. Last days. Well, now this would have had to been included in the moment in time that they were in. So the last days had to somewhat be in operation then because they're having this experience. But it's not the only last days that we're talking about. We're in the latter part of the last days. Amen. And it shall come to pass in the last days, saith God, I will pour out my, of my spirit upon all flesh. There it is again. And so we got an Old Testament with a New Testament update. I will, I will, I will, not I might, or maybe if you guys are blessed, or maybe to a select few. No, he said, I will pour out of my spirit upon all flesh, and your sons and daughters shall prophesy, your young men shall see visions, and your old men shall dream dreams. And so he told us things here related to that, but now I want to tie this down a little bit uh, further and you can read the in-between, but it, it's mostly a restatement of what we read in Joel 2. But if you go down here to verse 21, and it shall come to pass that whosoever shall call on the name of the Lord shall be saved. Now, see, Joel could not talk about salvation in the same way that Peter could. The reason he couldn't is because salvation in the way that we enjoy it in the New Testament was not available to Old Testament saints or Old Testament folk. Jesus had not yet gone to Calvary, went through that whole cross, crucifixion, ultimately descended into hell, and then was born again, really, according to Hebrews 1, born again in hell and became the firstborn from the dead. And now we who come through the blood and come in the name of Jesus and receive him as Lord and Savior, now we become sons and daughters of the Most High God. Well, that was not available to him in Joel, Joel's day. But it's available right now in Peter's day. And that's what he's saying. Now the point is this. He said, I will pour out of my spirit upon all flesh. Now this 21st verse tells you, whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. It tells you that this outpouring of the Holy Spirit is for the purpose of harvest. That's what it's about. God's not just pouring out His Spirit so we can have Pentecostal services at church. I mean, that's okay. I'm not putting any of that down. I mean, I'm just, I'm as wild as the rest of you. <laughs> Given the right moment, you know. But the point is, uh, that's not the point. It's not just so we can have exciting church services. Well, we're spirit-filled people. We have exciting church services. No, spirit-filled people win the lost. That's what he said. Yeah, that's what he said right there. So it's for the purpose of winning the lost. That's what this whole awakening, this whole revival, this whole unfolding of God's presence in a society is to harvest this earth. God is going to harvest this earth before Jesus comes and takes us out of here in the rapture. I believe that with all my heart. I believe, I believe that an awakening is as much prophesied as the sun coming up in the morning. I believe it's in here. I believe it's, it, it's important. And it, the reason that I want to put such an emphasis on it is because we are right now in such a potentially negative environment. 
And we feel like, well, the, the devil's taking over. He's not taking over. Uh-uh. Oh, no. What you have being revealed right now, the evil and everything that's going on, what you have is a revelation for an awakening. If you wasn't woke before, you ought to be getting woke now. Well, we didn't know they'd do that. Well, they showed you what they're made of. Well, we didn't think they'd really do that. They told you they were going to do it, and then they do it. Don't be surprised. And they're going to get a whole lot worse if allowed to run. But I got news for you. We hadn't seen yet the intervention of God in this thing. Oh, we may have seen a little bit, but you ain't seen the half of what's coming because this is in the B I B. L E and it's going to happen. Oh yeah. So they may be so sure of themselves at the moment, but, uh, it might be Friday, but, uh, as the saying goes, Sunday's a coming. Mm -hmm. There is a resurrection. You understand? Yeah. The devil, they were all, uh, shouting. I was going to say to high heaven, but I don't think they'd do that. <laughs> but they were all filled with glee when they got Jesus on that cross. The Bible says that the princes of this world, had they known, they would not have crucified the Lord of glory. But they're getting ready to get an awakening. Uh huh. Yeah, they're getting ready to get woke. Uh -huh. Just like what's going on right now. They're getting ready to get woke. But they hadn't seen the God of the Bible yet. Amen. Like they're getting ready to see him. I'm telling you what's getting ready to happen to this planet. It will be greater than the children of Israel coming out in the Exodus. You mark what I'm telling you. I mean... You getting ready to hear a sound like a rushing mighty wind. It's going to fill this earth with God's glory. Oh, you had not seen what's coming, but you're getting ready to. And I'm here to tell you today, I can't wait. Oh, I want to see. Oh, Lord, forgive me. I just want to see their nose get rubbed in it. Oh, yeah. Well, don't you walk in forgiveness? I'll forgive them, but I still want to see their nose get rubbed in it. I might forget, forgive, but I don't forget. Mm -hmm. That's scriptural too, by the way. Everybody said, well, you're supposed to forgive and forget. I'm not God. He forgives and forgets. He told me to forgive and remember. Well, how else are you going to learn anything if you keep forgetting everything? <laughs> Amen. It is a good word. Believe me, it is. Amen. Now we see here in Joel 2, 23, we read it, but I want to read it again. He said, be glad then, you children of Zion, and rejoice for the Lord your God, for he has given you the former rain moderately, and he will cause to come down for you the rain, the former rain and the latter rain in the first month. And so the former rain, former rain, and the latter rain is given for what? Harvest. Everybody say Harvest. Now we look over here in Ephesians chapter 5, again, a proof text. Let in the mouth of two or three witnesses, let every word be established. Ephesians chapter 5, verse 26, that he might sanctify and cleanse it. The it he's talking about here is the church. That he might sanctify and cleanse it, the church, with the washing of the water by the word. That he might present it. Present it what? The church. This is the presentation of the church to the Savior, the Lord, head of the church, that he might present it to himself. This is a big deal. It's only going to happen one time, period. 
in forever. And do you understand that Jesus left heaven for this? And you think he's going to mess it up? I don't think so. You think it's going to be second rate? I don't think so. It's not a B movie. You can bet this one's got all the budget that it needs. Mm -hmm. Yeah, look here. That he might sanctify and cleanse it to church by the washing of the water by the word, that he might present it to himself. Listen, a glorious church. Oh, well, the church, you know, we're going to be so whipped down. They're not going to let us sing in church. We're going to have to be masked to the hilt. We're going to be underground. We're not going to be able to meet. We're going to meet at 30%. I don't think so. Oh, no, I don't think so. Well, the church is so afraid. We're, we're, we're so intimidated by COVID-19. I don't think so. Uh -uh. Oh, no. That he might present it to himself a glorious church, not having spot or wrinkle or any such thing, but that it should be holy and without blemish. That word glorious means splendid, gorgeous, honorable, absolutely beyond magnificent, a glorious church. So Jesus, when he comes, when he comes, is coming for a glorious church. So does that tell you what your future looks like? Yeah. He's not coming for a whipped down bunch of radical hiding in the dark. Don't know what they're going to do. Give me my AK. I got to go, you know, protect myself. No, I'm, you know, I'm not against your AK if you want it, but I'm telling you, you he's coming for a church that's walking on the top. Not a, I'm talking about harvest child of God. I'm talking about an awakening. I'm not talking about something that just comes out here where people are born again. I'm talking about that, of course. But I'm talking about this glory that comes on his church, the glorious church. You understand that? That's in the Bible. Why do I believe in an awakening? Because of what I'm reading you. Let me tell you something. This is all end time stuff. It is, I mean, I know there have been visitations from God in the past, but I'm telling you, this stuff I'm telling you, it, I don't believe personally, I don't believe it's really in our future. I believe if we're awake, it's happening right now. And let me tell you, all this stuff, there's nothing going on in this world that took God by accident. He didn't just all say, oh man, this is going to be a bad day. He didn't get up one morning and say, this is horrible. He knew everything before it happened. And I'm telling you that God, who is the God who's more than enough, who knows it all, the end from the beginning, the front from the back, the top from the bottom, and everything in between. You going to tell me that this stuff took him by surprise and that the church, well, the church, you know, the, the poor old church, uh-uh. The greatest victories that are going to be won are ahead of us, not behind us. The church has done a lot of things in the past, but we had not seen anything like what's coming. I'm telling you, we're in the best days ever. Well, what are we going to do? We're locked down. We're locked out. No, we're not. We just think we are. You got to change the thinking. You got to get out of the captive mindset. That's what they're trying to do. Intimidate you out of your victory. Tell you you can't. Tell you you won't. Tell you you never will be. Tell you how they're going to run over you. How they're going to take over. You bunch of Goliath speaking thugs. I think we're going to take your head off, just like little David, the shepherd boy. Uh -huh. Yeah, you think you're bad. You ain't seen bad, but bad's coming. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you think you're bad. You ain't seen bad, but bad's coming. You think you got a big gorilla? Uh-uh. <laughs> no, 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 no. I went over to Rwanda, and that's up there where the gorillas are. It, 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 you know, I mean, you can go visit them if you want to. <laughs> but then they're back there, you know, in those, in those forests up there and stuff. And uh, I mean, those things are, you know, they're fierce. 
I mean, looking. But then they've come to understand they're not fierce at all. You can, you can go back there. they got trails back in there where you can walk with those gorillas. Now, I'd be careful. <laughs> I wouldn't, you know, <laughs> make too many sudden moves. But you probably need to go with a guide. But, but, you know, you can go up there. You can pay the money and you can go back there with those, with those gorillas, you know. And the, they get those big silverback gorillas up there and all that. And uh, I mean, you know, they're, 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 they're ferocious looking. Well, you think you got a big gorilla. You ain't seen who, who we got in our corner. <laughs> no, you, you, you know, do, do you know who's in our corner? Oh, you're going to do what to who? Not today. Oh, no, 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 no. See, but the church. The church is willing to give them. You can have what you say. Be it unto you according as you believe. I'm not giving in. I'm not giving up. I'm not shutting up. I'm not shutting down. And I'm not going to go along with it. I'm not. Well, you say well, you're awful bold. You ain't seen bold. But bold's coming. I'm serious. I'm not just talking. I'm telling you the truth. I'm telling you, we're going to have a fearless army of the living. You know, he is the, he, he's the Lord God, head of the church, advocate general of the armies of heaven. He is the God of Seboeth, not Sabbath, Seboeth. He is the Lord of hosts. You kidding me? We're going to quit? I don't think so. Jesus said, I tell you right now, no man takes my life from me. If I wanted to, I could call 12 legions of angels right now. A legion is 6,000. I could call 72,000 angels in here today. Then what you gonna do, big mouth? That's who's on our side. And you see evidence in the scripture where I mean one angel just gets on the scene and I mean 10,000 people are dead. One. And he said, I can call 72,000. No man takes my life from me. I give it. Church, nobody takes our victory from us. No, 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 no. You messing with the wrong crowd. Well, that's big talk. Well, it ought to be big talk. We serve a big God. Somebody ought to be saying something. David was making big talk, but who ended up losing his head that day? Wasn't David. The one that talked big and won the victory. The one over there with their knees smoting one against the other. That was the rest of the, you know, King Saul and the rest of them. They wouldn't even, they wouldn't even get out of the trench. But David, the little shepherd boy, he said, I'm going to tell you. He said, I was out there tending my sheep. And there was a line. You understand where Israel is? Do you understand in, 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 in geography? Do you understand to the north of Israel is Europe? And to, and to the east of Israel is, is Asia? And to the south of Israel is Africa? Do you understand that? When David said, the line came against me, he wasn't talking about one of these little pipsqueak bobcats that, you know, he's talking about an African lion coming out there to get his sheep. And that little shepherd boy put, killed the blooming lion. Now I'm going to tell you right now, that's some kind of good. <laughs> and a bear. Now I'm going to tell you, bears can be, you know, bears can be bears. You know, <laughs> and he killed a bear. He killed a lion. And he just said, that's just practice. He said, I want to tell you something, big boy. They tell us that Goliath was um, about 11 feet tall. Probably weighed seven to 800 pounds. That's a big boy. And David stood there and said, well, the same God that delivered the lion and the bear is the same God that will deliver you, big guy. You come at me 
boasting and bragging and blowing hard about what you're going to do. But he said, I come against you in the name of the Most High God, the God of, of whose I am and whom I serve. And I come to you in his name. Now, and they laughed him. They said they laughed him to scorn. Little old shepherd boy, little old ruddy shepherd boy, teenager. That's the day he became the king of Israel. Took a little while to manifest, but that's the day. God set up circumstances. You're alive. <laughs> it may be your deliverance. Your, de your Goliath may be your way <laughs> to the rich house. Not to the poor house, <laughs> to the rich house. When you think Goliath is going to take over, it may be your ticket to the top. They come away singing, Saul has slain his thousands, but David has slain his ten thousands. They were singing songs to this new little old lad of a boy who was nothing more than a little shepherd who trusted God. Amen. Yeah, they might not want your favor now, but there'll be a day coming. They'll wish to God they'd made friends with you. Mm -hmm. They might not like you now, but don't they know one day we're going to judge the angels. So you better like us because you got us forever. <laughs> I could really say a lot more about that. Amen. And this, this group, now, <laughs> this glorious church is typified in Scripture by the children of Israel when they came out of Egypt. Are you doing okay? Yes. Are you bored? No. Whoever you are, don't tell me. Uh, but in Exodus 3, it says that when they left Egypt, now it's a, it's, a, it's a type and a shadow of the rapture of the church. When they come out of Egyptian bondage, it's a type of the rapture of the church. And I won't read all the verses in between because I'm running out of time. Uh, but you see in Exodus 3 and 22, and I'm going to read this out of the Amplified Classic. It says, but every woman shall insistently solicit of her neighbor and her that, she may, that may be residing at her house jewels and articles of silver and gold and garments, which you shall put on your sons and your daughters, and you shall strip the Egyptians of the belongings due to you. In other words, they had cheated them out of 400 years of back wages and they got it all. Yeah, all this stuff they want to do to the church and cheat you and rob from you and steal from you and laugh at you and get you to vote for them, you evangelicals, while they laugh behind your back and won't do anything you, want, you know they should do. Just get your vote and lead you on and get your money and you better, get, you better go against all these liberals and send us more money while they do the same thing to you. It's a bunch of cons. In love. Amen. But he said, before we leave, we're going to take all your money, all your stuff, everything you got. Every, everything, everything you got, we're going to get it. That's the condition of the church before we go. Everything that they've connived, stole, lied about, done wrong to you, you're going to get it all back before you leave. In the B-I-B-L-E. Well, that won't happen. It won't happen to you maybe, but it's happening to me. I done found it in the book. I'm going to believe it. It's in the book. I said it's in the book. I said it's in the book. <laughs> and we find over here in Exodus 12, which is a restatement of this, verse 35, and, I, and I'm going to read it out of the Amplified. I don't have time to read both. He says, the Israelites did according to the word of Moses, and they urgently asked of the Egyptians, jewels of silver and gold, urgently asked. <laughs> I mean, they, the Egyptians gave it up voluntarily, but they were urgently asked. The Lord gave the people favor in the sight of the Egyptians so that they... Now, the Egyptians are a type of the world. See, the world is going to repay the church. You understand that? Okay. And the Lord gave the people favor in the sight of the Egyptians so that they gave them what they asked. And they stripped the Egyptians or stripped the world of those things. 
And you find in verse 38, very much livestock, flocks, and herds. So it was all their stuff. God made the church or the people of Israel wealthy on the way out. At the rapture of the church, the church will be that glorious church. The, listen, the fig tree and the vine do yield their strength together. Strength means wealth. The wealth is prophesied. It's coming to you. I said, it's coming to you. I said, it's coming to you. I said, it's coming to you. Now, let me read you Psalms 105, verse 37. I'm going to read it out of the Living Bible. And he brought his people safely out of Egypt, loaded with silver and gold. Remember, it's a type of the rapture. Loaded. Everybody say loaded. loaded. Say, load me up, Lord. Say, load me up, Lord. Say, pour it on, Lord. Well, I'm unworthy. Well, shut up. Don't tell anybody, and then maybe you'll get in on it. Get over your sin-based consciousness and understand you're a child of the Most High God. There. Amen. It says they were loaded with silver and gold and there was no sick or feeble folk among them. Going out with a high hand, you understand? That's the glorious church that Jesus is coming for. That's what's prophesied right there in the B-I-B-L-E. It's the book for me. So are we just blowing smoke to talk about an awakening? Or oh, have we got scripture for it? Now I'm going to give you one more text. James chapter 5 and verse number 1. It says, go to now ye rich men. You could say it this way and it would be helpful. Now let's go and talk about the rich men. That would be a good way to say it. Okay. So let's talk about the rich men now. Everybody say, we're going to talk about the rich men. We're going to talk about the rich men. I'm telling you, we're going to talk about the rich men. When I was in need, God told me to talk about the rich men. Thank you, Lord. <laughs> Go to now, you rich men, weep and howl. Oh, troubles are coming. You rich men that have been doing funny things with the stuff. <laughs> oh, I see. You bunch of crooks. <laughs> Go to now, you rich men, weep and howl for your miseries that shall come upon you. Oh, whoa, gloom, despair, and agony on me. <laughs> They used to sing about them in hee haw. <laughs> we got a line out of hee haw for you. <laughs> Gloom, despair, excessive misery. <laughs> Your riches are corrupted. Who's he talking to? Corrupt rich men. Now listen. Your riches are corrupted and your garments are moth-eaten. Does that not sound something like the Egyptians that pilfered the Israelis for 400 years? Let's read further. Your gold and silver is cankered. Your rust of them shall be a witness against you, and ye shall eat your flesh as it will fire. Oh, you got by with it, but Sunday's coming. You did it. Now what you going to do? You understand this is a prophecy to the rich men? I'm talking about corrupt rich men that have pilfered you, your country, this globe, poor people all over this planet that they've robbed at every level. 
this has not been fulfilled. But it has to be. It is in the Bible. It is a prophetic word. Look what he said. Your gold and silver is cankered. The rest of them shall be a witness against you. You shall eat your flesh as it were fire. You have heaped treasure together for the last days. So this is a last day prophecy to the rich men who have pilfered, corrupted, stole, lied to. How can a person go be a senator for 10 years and come out with $50 million when they never made any money? You tell me how. On your back. Well, now you shouldn't be saying that. Well, I shouldn't be saying it. Somebody ought to say it. How does it happen? Well, they got a good book deal. They ain't even written a book. <laughs> Behold the hire of the laborer. Now listen, <laughs> this is, go back to the, to the children of Israel in Egypt. Behold the hire of the laborer, which reaped down your fields, which you kept back by fraud. Crieth, and the cries of them which have reaped are entered into the ears of the Lord of Seboeth. That's the Lord of hosts. And I'm going to tell you who he is. His name is Jesus of Nazareth. You may make fun of him. You may ridicule him. You must, may tell us we can't speak in his name. Don't assemble in his name. Don't sing to him. Oh, he's coming. And you might not think we ought to sing to him, but there'll be a day you wished you had. Mm -hmm. You have lived in pleasure on the earth. You've been wanting. You've nourished your hearts as in the day of slaughter. You've condemned and killed the just. Oh, I'm pro-choice. Really? No, you're an outright stinking lying murderer. Is what you are. And there's no more just than the innocent in the womb. Well, I don't have time to redo it. You got to get it on the first pass. Amen. You've lived in pleasure on the earth. You've been wanting. You've nursed your hearts as in the day of slaughter. You've condemned and killed the just. And he doth not resist you. How can an innocent infant resist you? Child traffickers. Be patient, therefore, brethren. So now we get in the picture. Mm. Be patient, therefore, brethren, unto the coming of the Lord. So God said, I'm going to fix it before I take my church out of here. He's coming for a church without spot, wrinkle, blemish, glorious church. The way the children of Israel came out of Egypt with a high hand. That's what's coming. Be patient, therefore, brethren, unto the coming of the Lord. Behold, the husbandman waiteth for the precious fruit of the earth. That's harvest. And hath long patience for it until receive the early and latter rain. Do you understand that this financial reset is prophesied in the Bible for the purpose of latter-day harvest, the awakening, and the revival that's coming. There is a financial inversion coming. Likes of, listen, this is global in nature. It's coming as surely as the sun comes up in the morning. And guess who's on the good side of it? Be patient, brethren, because it's coming to you. And all that they've stolen, and pilfered, and lied about, and connived to get, it's all coming your way. You mean individually? Yeah. Collectively, of course, but individually. I mean, who makes up the church? Us. Uh, as I say down here where we live, youans. <laughs> Weans. Usans. It's us. I talk about somebody somewhere else. It's us. Amen. 
Be patient, therefore, brethren, unto the coming of the Lord. Behold, the husband and man waiteth for the precious fruit of the earth, and hath long patience for it until he receive the early and the latter rain. Be ye also patient, establish your hearts for the coming of the Lord draw nigh. This is prophesied just prior to the rapture of the church. It's coming. Can't happen after the rapture of the church because you're in the tribulation then. It's not coming then. It's coming before the rapture of the church. This is you he's talking to. This is us he's talking to. Maybe Friday now. Joe. But Sunday's coming. You may think you're getting by with it. You're not getting by with nothing. Your payday's coming. And not just when you leave this life. Your payday's coming before you leave this life. This is in the Bible. That's why I say to you, and I say with a certain amount of boldness, which some don't seem to like, but I took inventory and I just concluded, I don't really care what you think. I don't. I don't care so much. If we're taking opinions, you know what they say about them, don't you? <laughs> Uh, establish your hearts, brethren. The coming of the Lord draweth nigh. Now that's why I'm telling you, and I believe wholeheartedly from the bottom of my heart, that what's going on right now, and you think that it's taken over, I prophesy to you, it's not taken over. And I'm not just dreaming it up or going back and rehearsing a YouTube prophecy. I read this to you out of the Bible. Now, I would die believing that. Amen. You couldn't change me. You can't sway me. You can't stop me. I believe that. Amen. Jesus is coming. And if you're not on his side, you better run for the tall grass. Because you ain't going to like this. And all the conniving, cheating, stealing, lying, all the global this and global that, and all the people that have thought they could destroy nations at the whim of a stroke of their pen. How are you rich men? Because it's coming. The Lord of the Seboeth is coming to your house. Mm -hmm. Child of God. Now let me say this to you out there that are watching today, and if you're in the room as well. The Lord of Seboeth that's Jesus Christ. He wants to be your Lord. He wants to take you in his family. He wants to give you the assurance that he's promising to you through these passages of scripture. Your future is greater than anything you could imagine if you're in him. Be patient, brethren. It's coming. But you have to make him the Lord of your life first. You have to be willing to receive Jesus. Pray this prayer with me today. Say, Jesus. I take you today as my Lord and my Savior. I give my life to you to serve you today and forever. Forgive me of my sins. Jesus, I make you the Lord of my life. Now, if you prayed that prayer, I know you meant it or you wouldn't pray it. Let us know. There's a way there on the screen where you can do that. Every time that we do this, we find people every single time coming to Christ. And for that, we say, thank God. And we're happy for you. But we want to know about you because we pray for you. We want to see you. And, you know, we may never see you on this earth. That's the amazing thing about this. But we may not see you here, but we'll spend eternity together. And that's the joy of this kind of thing that we do. The eternal benefit of what we're involved in and what we're engaged in. Let's give our friends a great big praise God, can we? Amen.